Uh, good morning. Uh, I have to apologize for my voice <clears throat> ahead of time if I'm coughing and uh, sounding like a Peruvian throat singer. I apologize. Um, I was Peruvian throat singing in the shower today, and my wife was like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "Just throat singing." <laughs> She's like, "What is that?" I'm like, "Just YouTube it." It's uh, pretty interesting. I'm sure nobody here is laughing besides Ian, so he's probably the only one that's actually seen it. But it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty funny. They do a little sing with the throat when they have a little voice. <clears throat> so, anyways. <clears throat> Acts chapter 15, this is part number 6, and uh, I know we've been spending a good amount of time in, in this passage. Uh, it, it just happens to be one of my favorite passages of the scripture, so that's why we, we're spending a good amount of time. Uh, plus, it's also a really, uh, it's a good piece of ammunition, you know? This is like a, uh, this is like a, uh, if you know what a big old 50 cal is, you know what that is? A 50 cal gun, you know? Yeah. The, the big one? <laughs> yeah. Nah, that's what this passage is, and when it comes to justification, you know, it, it could, it may even be the atomic bomb. I, I think the atomic bomb is like Romans three and four, but this is this is a this has got a lot of ammunition in it. This has got a lot of pieces, uh, because you know, back in Romans three and four, what do people? What is one of the arguments people always say relating to justification? Well, well, that's what Paul said, right? Uh, that's, that's just what Paul's got to say about the subject matter. Well, the good thing is, is we have everybody gathered here together, and if there was a point in time, that would be, uh, you know. Uh, advantageous for somebody to speak up and say, well, you know what, we think it's all wrong, and we think that justification is actually by the law, where would it be? It, it would be right here in this in this passage. So when you get Peter, James, John, and all the other elders and apostles and everybody else gathered together, uh, we see that there's a communication by Paul about the, you know, the, the, the need of this, and then also, you know, there's a realization by Peter, he, he understands it, he gets it, he's seeing the law, and he goes, look, they're, they're, nobody's kept this thing, right? It's, it's, not, it's not possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to discuss a little bit more in detail um, the problem uh, that occurs when, when man believes that he can be justified, you know, that is to be declared righteous by the law of Moses. Uh, this way of thinking is a result of, as we've been discussing, an incorrect viewing of the law. And, and I would say it's really more of an impartial understanding of the law. Uh, it, it's, it, you don't really get the full-blown widespread implications of your statement. When you say something like, <clears throat> well, I can be justified by the law, well, well, so you can be as righteous as God can be by doing? Well, well no, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, but see, the, the, you have to remember that the law is, is both a testament and a manifestation of the absolute righteousness of God, right? Yes. And so the, the, the law was taught to the people of Israel for, for over, you know, over 1,500 years, and, and we saw that they read that law when? Continually in that, in, the, in that synagogue, right? They sat down, as we read in Acts chapter number 15, and in verse number, uh, if you read in verse number 21, it says, For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So this is something that they were reading. They're reading, they're reading, they're reading. They're constantly reading the law of Moses. So, so what, was the, what was the problem, right? Well, as we discussed, there was a lack of honesty when it came to the law. There was a lack of, of proper contextual understanding about the law. They, they read that law. It's not that they didn't read it, right? Oh, they just, they just uh, you know, for, forsook Moses. No. No, they were, they were telling Christ that he was forsaking Moses, right? They, they complained to Peter, or to, to Paul, that he was telling them that, that, that they're teaching him to forsake Moses, right? No. The issue was, there was a lack of honesty when the law was read. So we showed that, you know, back in, 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 uh, in, in uh, Nehemiah 8.8, 8, when Ezra was there with the other priest, he sat down and gave the people, you know, sense, gave the people understanding, sat down and gave them the law. And what was the response of the people? When they sat there and they read all the law, they, they did what? They mourned. And, 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 then they, and then they wept about that. And, and that's, that's good because what that shows is there's an honest appreciation for just the righteousness of God and the unrighteousness that is in man's flesh. So over 1,500 years, there, there existed a, a flawed view of the law, a, a view of the law in which you're going to you know, self-justify, right? The law is not going to justify. You make that very clear. They're not, they're not, they're, they're, it's self-justification underneath the law, right? It's not that the law is justifying. It's their, themselves that are justifying, um, that, you know, being justified, right? Because what the law estimates, right, is uh, you know, th that, that they are, in fact, uh, not good, and that they are not perfectly righteous. So where does this thought process come from? Where does it happen? Why is it necessary to, to truly understand the law? Well, to really understand the law is to really have a better understanding and appreciation for the righteousness of God. To really understand the law is to have a better appreciation for the cross of Christ, right? To, to understand the law is to have a better appreciation for the grace of God. Wow, really? Well, how can you understand the grace of God when you understand the law? Well, you're starting to do what? Where? What happens? Where, what does the law enter for? 
that the offense might abound, and where sin did abound, grace did much more abound, right? You see how the formula works, that logic is, look, let's show you tons of sin. Let's just keep, let's just keep jamming it on you. Just show you the whole thing so you can come back and go, he, all of that? Yeah, he took care of it all. Every single one? Yep, every single one. Wow, that's pretty incredible, right? So again, it's 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 glorifying who? God, and it's doing what to you? It's de-glorifying you. That's the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is not to put you up on a pedestal, it's to put God up on a pedestal. It's to, it's to raise up God and his righteousness and to show you again your unrighteousness. <laughs> so what happens is there's two places, Satan and of course the flesh that that like the law in, in its in its false context, right? Anybody that's in the spirit looks at the law and says, eh, eh. No, 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 no. We know what that law is about. <clears throat> Let's make it clear from the outset that the law is made for your flesh. Do you understand what that means? That the law is made for your flesh. Do we live in the flesh today? Well, of course we live in the flesh. We're stuck in it, right? We're stuck in it until the point in time, and either the rapture occurs or until the point in time in which we, we depart from this flesh, right? So, you know, how, how does one live in the flesh, but then at the same point in time, you know, live in the spirit? This is something that you know Scott was, or Todd was talking about last uh, Sunday and um, last Wednesday as well, which we'll be posting those sermons. I apologize for being a little bit late on those. So, again, the law is made for your flesh. It's made to simply amplify the results of what resides in every man. It's, it's made to amplify what your flesh does. What does Paul say about your flesh? Look at Romans chapter number 7. <coughs> <coughs> Romans chapter number 7 and verse number 18, Paul says this. He says, For I know that in me... So he makes a clarification. He knows who he is. He says, In me, that is where? In my flesh. Right? Does he still live in his flesh? Yeah, of course. Dwelleth what? No good thing. Read that again. For I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. Got it? And where is that in me? That is in my flesh. See, when you when you really understand this, I mean, I mean, I feel like I have such a uh, I've studied this out for for I mean, really hours and weeks, really of time in my head. Probably, if you took all the hours, it would add up to weeks of time that I've thought about this, I've read it, I've studied it out. And you know what? It, you know what it really gives you? It gives you a tremendous peace because you know. See, what the law does is it brings about a lot of condemnation. The law brings about a lot of death in your life. It brings about what? Well, where, 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 where the law keeps increasing, what keeps increasing? You know, the knowledge of sin, right? So you keep seeing more and more and more sin, and you go, oh, I'm overwhelmed with the amount of sin that, I, that I've committed or, or am committing. And so uh, what I like about this passage is look what he says in verse number uh, 18. He says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God, where? After the inward man. What is that? You know, that is the appreciation. The, the, the new man appreciates the righteousness in the law. The new man looks at the law and says, look, I got no problem with the law. It condemned me, right? It condemned me because what happened? Sin came and it, and it, and it slaughtered me. See, the law didn't kill him. Sin, you know, that it might become exceedingly sinful, slaughtered them underneath the law. So what he does, he goes, look, I, I, I like the law, right? Remember he says, is that which is made good made death unto me? Right? Remember those passages we just went through just a little bit ago? Go back over uh, to uh, uh, look at look at Romans chapter number seven for just a second, and look at verse number eight. He says, "For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death." For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore what? The law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. See, what is that? That's the appreciation for the righteousness of the law. And then he comes on to say this in verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? No, 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 no. God forbid. Sin is what kills you. 
the wages of the law don't kill you, right? Romans 6.23 doesn't say the, well, the, way, the wages of law is death. No, it's the wages of sin is death. So as you read here, he says, but God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That is one of the craziest things you can think about. The law is actually good. It's really good when it's used properly. Okay, you see how that works? Like when it's used properly, it's really, really good. And so he says here, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So that's what we should, we should approach. We should, we should have this understanding, as, as verse number 22 says, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Of course I do. Of course I look at the law of God and go, well, thank you, God, I'm not under it. And I say, thank you, God, that you're so much more righteous than I am and capable of destroying that enmity that was by the law. Perhaps no other verse can really, you know, so succinctly, um, you know, uh, d define this than look over at, uh, look at Romans chapter number... Uh, Sorry, where am I at here? My, my verses are all over here. Uh, look at Romans chapter number 7, verse number 5. No other verse really concludes this than, than this passage right here, okay? <clears throat> he says this, For when we were in the flesh... Well, well, what comes out of the flesh? Well, what does Paul say in the end of Romans chapter 7? He says, I know that in my flesh dwelleth what? No good thing. So... What's the opposite of good, bad, evil, sin? So as you see here in verse number five, for when we are in the flesh, what's going to come out of the flesh? Good things? Lots of good things, right? When in my flesh, I do plenty of good things and God pats me on the back and says, welcome into heaven, buddy. You did a great job. No, he says this, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins. Notice that. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins. See, that's what the flesh is all about. The flesh is we're going to go and look through here is that the law is made for the flesh of the man. That there's an amplification of not that which is good, but that what? That sin might appear sin. Right? Yep. So when you get into, into Acts chapter number 15 and you see these guys saying, Hey, it's needful you get circumcised and command them to keep the law of Moses. You look and you just go like, we look at it and say, how could you be so foolish? How could you be so silly to think that you're going to do that? Did you not read any of it? Did you not read the testimony of Scripture, the testimony of the prophets, the testimony of Jesus Christ? Did, did you not understand what he came to do? So in verse number five, which he says, from we were in the flesh, the motions of sin. Now notice what it says. Notice this now. Notice this. Which were by the law. You see how that works? Read it. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law. See, when you're operating underneath the, the law, okay, and you're trying to do it, in order to obtain some type of righteousness, it's just the motions of sin. It's continual. You say, well, how, how does that really work? Doesn't it seem like, doesn't it seem really counterintuitive for God to, to give this big, long law? Why would he even bother doing that? What was we looked in Galatians 4, remember? You're under tutors and governors until the times appointed by the Father. The purpose is the bigger picture. The purpose is to see, look, we had to give you this law to demonstrate the righteousness of God. We gave it to a particular group of people who had it, who were instructed in Deuteronomy 4. It goes on in great detail and says, hey, they're really uh, you know, close to God. God tells them everything to do down to the nitty gritty about when you put the blood on your thumb and your big toe and you do all these little things and how could you ever mess it up if he tells you everything to do well look it, it's just like this i got that table over there you know and when i got it i had an instruction book and you know what i did i looked through it real quick and said yeah i got this right i i got this i, I can do it and the majority of the people when they do and unless you meditate day and light on that law you, you don't really understand it that's why I, I really encourage people after they've you know become established a little bit to go back to the law too and start to really read it and understand just what god has saved you from just, just how much he's taken away from uh, you in terms of your condemnation. He says, I took all that off. I, 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 as we're going to look here, he took the enmity, which was by that law and against God, and he, and he slayed it. So Romans 7, verse number 5, <clears throat> read it again. From we were in the flesh, right? And we know that the, the logical statement is, in the flesh dwelleth no good thing. The motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth what? Notice what it says. Fruit unto death. So now we see that how Romans 6, 23 works. For the wages of sin is death, right? So what is it that, what are we going to do then? Well, you got to find out what the gift of God is, right? But the gift of God is what? But the gift of God is eternal life, not death, right? So obviously then if the, if the gift of God is eternal life, it has nothing to do with, with, with our flesh, right? 
It, it has nothing to do with the motions of sin. Eternal life's not going to come that way. And eternal life's not going to come by the law. Because when our law and our sin and our flesh works, all it does is, is brings forth fruit unto what? Brings forth fruit unto death. See, God's, God's view of your flesh never changes. Okay? The this, this spiritual position and the view is maintained regarding the flesh. It, it always maintains this. That there's the motions of sin. That your flesh can only bring fruit unto death. As we just read in Romans 7, that, that your flesh dwelleth no good thing. Ephesians 2.15 says that the flesh is enmity against God and that Jesus Christ in his flesh came to abolish the enmity that was in our flesh by the law, right? So whose flesh did that? Look at that verse in Ephesians 2 and verse number 15. Read verse 14, he says, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh, notice that, his flesh, the enmity. What is the enmity? Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, and so making peace. And how he how, how did he do that? And he says that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain, notice that, having slain the enmity, right? The whole summation of all this is found in the single verse. You know what the single verse is? It's Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 8. All of this, relating to the flesh, relating to the law, relating to justification, it, it, it's, it's, it's just so succinctly said in one verse. Look at Romans 8 and verse number 8. It says this, So then, this, that's the conclusion of what's happened between 8.1 to 8.7. He says, So then, they that are in the flesh, notice this phrase, cannot please God. It doesn't say sometimes please God. It doesn't say they can do it if they're believers and then they try to do it in the flesh. No. It says it really clear. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. It's not post-justification. It's not occasionally. It's not if you try really hard. It's actually just not even possible that if you're in the flesh to please God. So if we talk that the, that the law is about your flesh, right? That the, that the, that the law uh, magnifies the, the sin that resides in your flesh. <clears throat> and then those motions of sin which were by the law brought forth fruit unto death. It, it's, it's no good thing. It's, it, how, how could these guys be so naive to think this other way? Why are they thinking that they're going to, why are they thinking that they're going to get it uh, by the law? Well, there, there's, there's a couple, couple reasons why that is. We'll go back to Acts chapter 15 for just a second and we'll read through this. Why would the, why would the Jew say, I can keep the law. I can do it. You need to do it. What benefit are they looking for? Well, let's talk about that for a second. Underneath the law, did they get a benefit for partial obedience? No, right? They didn't get a benefit for partial obedience. They got a benefit for total and complete obedience. How many times do we see total and complete obedience from the nation of Israel? I, I, I don't even, I can't even think of one off the top of my head where they were just, you know, being, you know, everybody's doing everything perfectly. You know, there's always stuff going on. And, and that's why we constantly see, a, 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 you know, a God working with them and them paying the price uh, for their disobedience. Read in verse number, chapter 15 and verse number 7. So, I'll actually read verse number 5. And there rose up certain sect of the Pharisees which believed, this is Acts 15, verse number 5, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So what I was trying to think of is like, why would they say that? What, what is going through their heads, right? Well, I'm going to tell you what's going through their heads. You know what's going through their heads? They want to glory in their flesh. That's what it is. They want to rule over them. They want to put the thumb down on them. They want to have something where they can control them. Well, we have something over top of them. We're going to tell them to do this. Command them to keep the law of Moses. And we're going to look at these verses in just a little bit and see the real motive, right, behind that. And it's in Galatians 6. We'll look at it in just a second. 
But in Acts 15, and verse number 5, it says that there rose up certain sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been noticed much disputing, not something that was resolved after just, you know, oh, oh oops, yeah, we were all wrong, no big deal, right? After there had been much disputing, I like how it's interesting that Peter is the guy who raises up. Well, we know why Paul's not going to be the guy that's going to raise up, right? Why is it not going to be Paul that's going to raise up here and start talking to him? Well, let's let's go back to Galatians chapter 2 for just for a second, okay? Hold your place next to the team. We're going to flip. See, see Paul, Paul's not going to get up there and start yelling at him because here's the reason why. Uh, look at Galatians chapter 2. In verse number one, then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Titus and took Titus uh, with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but notice, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by what? Any means I should run or had run in vain, right? And notice what he says in verse three, but neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, okay? But he, verse four, and that because a false brethren unawares brought in who came in pri privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that we might bring us unto bondage. See, the people there in, in, uh, in, in Jerusalem are gonna listen to Peter more than they're gonna listen to Paul, right? You see that? So I always sat there, I'm like, why didn't Paul stand up and be like, Romans chapter 3, verse 28, 29. Like, why didn't, he, why didn't he hammer this stuff out, you know? Well, because if he did that, what's going to happen? He would have run in vain. Everybody probably would have killed him. They would have just jumped on him, and they would have done what they did in Acts chapter number 21. Remember? <laughs> and in Acts chapter 21, yeah, they did. They won in that one. And in Acts chapter 21, what's he got to do? And in 22, he starts off. He says, men and brother, and he gets up there in his Hebrew tongue, and he starts talking to him and going, what are you doing? That's when he starts to get, like, frustrated at this situation. That's when he's like, you know what? I get it. I'll, I'll say my piece right here and right now. And he goes over. Remember that in Acts chapter 22. If you read what he says there, he makes a distinction. Go, look at there just for a second. Acts chapter 22. <clears throat> he gets, he gets, he, you know, he goes up there and he tries to be nice with James and John and the rest of the guys there. And in Acts chapter 22, he says this. Men, brethren, fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he saith, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, the city of Cilicia, yet brought up on, in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and notice, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. See, I was zealous of the law when I didn't have the understanding of the law, just like Romans chapter number 10, right? For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, goeth about, goeth about to establish their own righteousness, and not submit themselves to the righteousness of God, right? For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness by, you know, by, by faith in Jesus Christ. So as you can see here, what he's doing, he's making this distinction. He says, I see how zealous you guys are about this, but now I'm telling you, that's, that's not. My zeal now is that Philippians chapter number three zeal. You know? My zeal is that you know, if any man have confidence in the flesh, I'm more, right? That's he's speaking as a fool when he does that. He's like, I'm just going to play this game about glorying in the flesh. And, and, and if you want to play the game of who's, who's kept the law better, uh, according to the law, I was blameless. Touching, touching the, the righteous which is in the law, you know, hey, that's me. So when you get back into Acts chapter 15 and Peter stands up here, there's a reason why. Peter's the guy that stands up because he's, he's kind of like the leader, right? He's the one that's been there. He's the one that's been, you know, as we've talked about, given the, the, the keys to the kingdom. And you read in Acts chapter 15, verse number 7, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said, hey guys, I'll listen to Paul real quick. He's got some good things to say. You know, I like to do that, and I think that's helpful to my understanding, is to say like the, something that didn't happen. The reason why is because you go, well, I, I didn't know it said that. I don't want to get your attention, so in case you're daydreaming, you go, well, well I said that? <laughs> so now you know my secret. Now you're not going to pay attention anymore. But. And he says, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, <coughs> ye know... <clears throat> how that a good good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe and we're going to talk about this in a little bit uh, we're going to have to discuss which event that is when did when did God make choice among us that that what that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel is it Acts chapter 10 is it Acts chapter 1, verse 8? Is it Matthew 28, Mark 16? Is it which, which part is it, Luke 24? Where is it that God made choice among us? We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Verse number 8, he says, And God which knoweth the hearts. I like how he prefaces that. 
You know, that's something that goes way back even as far as Second Samuel. You know, when they picked David, you know, God looketh where? God looketh on the inward, but man looketh on the outward, right? God looks on the heart, man looks at the outward appearance, he looks at the stature, and what are the Judaizers doing? They're looking on the outward. They're looking, hey, you circumcised? Paul's like, oh my goodness, okay. Circumcision is not which that not which is that one outwardly, but is that which is inwardly, you know? He could have got up there and started rambling. He would have he already knows that, right? In Acts chapter 15. It's not like he's gonna sit up there. Why? Because if there's any doubt, you know, remember, Titus, who was with him, was not compelled to be circumcised, okay? So who, who compelled him otherwise? Paul did. You follow me? Paul already had that doctrine. He communicated that to Titus and said, like, there's no need for you to get circumcised, and here's the reasons why, right? And then the other guys come in, and they give their argument. They say, no, you need to be circumcised with this, 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 and this. And Titus goes, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with Paul on this one, right? I'm going to probably... Probably the pain scale would maybe be one of the influencing factors, but, you know, other reasons why, from a doctrinal perspective. He says, And God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. In verse number 9, notice this, And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by what? By faith. So that's great. It's a great statement. We have Peter right there and then saying that a man is justified by faith. Now, is this all dispensations? Of course, because look what he says in verse number 10. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God? I love that. Why tempt ye God? It's kind of like saying, do you, do you think you know better than God on this issue? I, I don't think you do. He says, now, why tempt ye God to put a yoke? Now, I love where he goes back to it. He loves to go, he goes right back to the issue of that law as being a yoke, as being what? A bondage. He says, he put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers. So what does that tell you? So this wasn't happening back, and this is not a dispensational change, right? Oh, dispensational change. Men are now justified by faith, right? No, 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 no. You see how this text works? Look what he says. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? So he's giving a conclusion that in all times, men are always justified by faith. That's the only conclusion that can be made from this passage. And the reason why, look what he says in verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. And how is that? That's the purification of the hearts by faith. See, in Galatians chapter number 6 and verse number 12, Paul says this about this situation here. He says, look, these guys who are there with you, right? Look at this. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 12. These guys here who are persecuting the Galatians, he says, <coughs> he says, as many, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. What is that? It's a show. It's a charade. A fair show in the flesh, what? They constrain you to be circumcised. This is just something they're going through. These are the motions. They don't really understand what they're doing. And we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 3 in just a minute. But they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Wow. So what does that mean? So what he's showing you here is that, that there are people who are aligning themselves with circumcision over the cross of Christ. And going on in verse number 13, he says, look at this. He, he tells you. He says, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. Well, yeah. <laughs> we know that, right? We, we, we know that. John chapter 5. We discussed all those passages. You know, they say, they say, oh, we have Moses as our disciple. We trust in Moses. And Christ looks at us and says, there is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. If you had believed him, you would have believed me. See, they didn't believe him. They didn't even believe the law when it was read because they didn't want to be honest about the situation. So what is that purpose of the law then? Why, why have it? What was the, why, why have it? Well, Galatians 4 explains why you have it, right? What, what was the purpose of it? And even Galatians 3, it goes to even, even more detail on it as well. The purpose of it is to do what? Really, to, to glorify the cross even more. To magnify the work of God even more, Right? So the more we show that law, the more we can show, wow, look what the cross really did. It's what gives the cross more power. See, without the law, the, the cross is just not as powerful. It doesn't, it doesn't really have that power. You go, okay, well, where's, that, where's really the overarching of the sin and the condemnation? Well, look, here's the sin, here's the condemnation, here's the death, here's the guilty decree, right? Now we know whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth will be stopped, and the whole world will become guilty before God. There's the guilty decree, and then where's the pardon? The pardon is the cross. And you go, wow, okay, right? So it's kind of like, oh, here you're pardoned. Pardoned from what? What do I need to be pardoned from? I didn't need to be pardoned from anything. 
Here's the law, right? Just like he says, the law was our schoolmaster, right? To bring us to Christ. So those, those Jews, what happened? They were too cool for school. <laughs> they didn't want to pay attention in school. They just sat there and were like, oh yeah, we're, we got it. We got this thing done. They went through the motions. And what did the motions bring them? The motions brought forth what? Brought forth sin. Because why? They continued in their flesh to do it. What would be the response underneath the law? God have mercy upon me, please. There's no way we can keep this thing. God would say, wow, you're learning. That's, that's great. See, what it comes down to is, if you look in the, even in the stuff in Matthew, he says, seek ye first his righteousness, right? Right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things should be added unto you. Right? You see this concept of, it's not seek ye first your righteousness. What is your righteousness? If you look back at Deuteronomy chapter number 8, he says, if we do all these things, it shall be unto us as our righteousness. Right? If we do all these things, it's given unto us as our righteousness. You know, there's probably one of the best verses on this. I love what it says, right? So Paul in, in Romans chapter 4 when he gets there, they, 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 you know, he, he does that anticipatory argument type of, of approach, right? Where he says, you know, well, what shall we say then? You know, uh, uh, Abraham. Well, what do we say about that guy? You know, we got you right now, Paul. You forgot about Abraham. Oops. Well, no, Peter just told you. Our fathers didn't keep it. Well, Abraham wasn't even under the law anyways, right? But, you know, he's going and showing you. So what, what about Abraham? What, what do we do about this guy? And he, I love how Paul just, he, he just says, well, what say it the scripture, right? He points him back to the record and testimony of the scripture. That's, that's where you go. That's where you look at. So these guys, they were too, they were too, school, too cool for school. They didn't want to read. They didn't want to, they didn't want to uh, you know, be honest with it. I love what he says, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but why? Why do they do this? But desire to have you circumcised that they may glory, where? They may glory in your flesh. They like to make a fair show in the flesh. Like that, remember? As many as there are to make a fair show in the flesh. Look at all these guys I got circumcised. Look at all these guys who are underneath the oppression of the law, right? It's just like those other verses we were reading back in Galatians 4, <clears throat> that they zealously affect you, right? They zealously affect you, but not well. They zealously affect you, but not unto a good thing. See, the people that are in the spirit uh, are being persecuted here in Acts chapter 15 by those you know, born of the flesh. And that happens from time past until today. And uh, I want to go through the rest of these passages in Galatians chapter 4. Turn there for me. So the, the, the persecution that results in Galatians chapter, uh, in Acts chapter 15 about those individuals who are, um, they're, they're scared. They're concerned. In Galatians chapter 1, they, they, he says they are troubled about these people telling them to keep the law. Well, yeah, you should be troubled. So in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19, look what he says. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. This is Paul really hammering these guys and saying, I want to be there and I want to change my voice and I want to yell at you. I want to get, I want to, I'm angry about this situation. This makes me angry that you guys would depart on this point. Right? Why? Why is he so angry about this? Well, you know, back in Galatians 3, he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath heavenly set forth, crucified among you? This only what I learn of you, receive you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Notice, are you so foolish? Do you not understand the logic here? Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? doesn't work. The maturing process isn't get saved, here's Deuteronomy. Right? That's not how it works. We don't do that today and Jesus Christ didn't do that. He didn't get him, you know, you know, preach him the gospel and say, you should know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Now here's the, here's the bondage again. Right? It doesn't make any sense. So in Galatians 4 and verse number 21, he says, tell me ye that desire to be under the law. <coughs> Do you not hear the law? That is, do you, have you ever read it? Do you really understand it? Are you being honest in your approach with the law? Or are you simply believing what they're telling you about the law? You want to be under the law? Tell me. You hear it? What's it telling you? Because your conscience and your heart inside of you should be telling you one thing. Condemnation. Death can't keep it. That's what you should be feeling when you get the law. When you get that law placed over you, you know, many times I've had people tell me, I just don't know if I'm saved. What do you mean? What do you, what do you mean you're, how do you, how do you not, what do you mean you're not saved? What, what, what are you feeling? 
well, I, I know I got to do this or this. Or, well, yeah, because you don't do anything you're supposed to do. Oh, that's right. You know, how many times do you do everything you're supposed to do? Well, never. Right. So why would it be any different in this situation? Who told you to do that? Well, these guys, they told me. I went to this camp this one time. I went to these camps, the Wilds of the Rockies. I, I had guys who were getting saved. You're, you know, they're 15, 16 years old. I've grown up with them for my whole life, and they're out there getting saved again. I'm going, what? What do you mean you're getting saved again? You mean you're living a life of sin, and, and, and somebody called you out on it, <laughs> and then you don't think you're saved? Okay. You, you see how that works? And, and so what do they do? They, they well, you better get on, get on the treadmill here. Okay, you're on the treadmill? Good, okay. Here's the care, your salvation. Just keep walking. But I'm tired. I don't care. There's no rest. I, it doesn't matter. Just keep walking. Unless you do this, unless you persevere to the end, you won't be saved. I got a verse for that. Whew. See how easy it is to do that? What benefit is that? You see why that's why people just fall off the, the thing? Like, like, like uh, Todd was saying, you know, his buddy's like, man, I'm going to sell out for Jesus. Good. You sell out for Jesus for about a week and maybe, maybe, maybe it'll last a year. You know me and my buddies who have done that? Dude, I'm selling out for Jesus, man. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to any parties where there's drinking. I'm going to disown all my friends. And then the dude's gone. We never, we never see the guy anymore, right? And then we find out like three years later, he's like, what was it, cokehead? Wow. <laughs> what happened to him? Oh, he just, he couldn't handle it anymore. He had to escape. Well, that's what happens to the law. You reach a point where you're just like, I'm dead. I'm dying. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so condemned here. I can't, I can't figure out what to do. They've never experienced the liberty that is in Christ Jesus, right? <clears throat> that's why Paul says to stand fast. He wouldn't tell you to stand fast if there weren't people who are trying to knock you over, right? You follow me? Yeah. Stand fast. So you can either stand like this on one little foot on your little toe and be like this, and anytime somebody comes over, you get you get pushed over, or you can stand like this and take a hit. I'm sure Todd can talk to you about how to take a hit in football. I don't know how to take a hit in football, but I'm sure there's a right way to take a hit and there's a wrong way to take a hit, you know? And you want to stay on your feet so you can keep keep blocking. And so when it comes down to this, he says here, he says, Tell me, ye that desire to be in the law, do you not hear the law? That's it. Read it. If you think you're if you think you're getting justified by the law, I encourage you to go back, you know, talk to that person and say, let's let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter number one. Okay? And let's let's say, are you better than all these other guys? Because number one, he goes on to say, Don't be like your fathers, because <laughs> they didn't do this right. And here's the second reiteration of this. And now when he reads down through here, he says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one a bond woman and the other a free woman. But he who was of the bond woman was born after the what? After the flesh. Remember we talked about this. He says, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, which uh, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this is Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above us all, or above us, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou, barren that bearest, break uh, forth, and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of the promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. How do they persecute? They zealously affect you. They trouble you. Nevertheless, they want to make a show in your flesh, right? They want a glory in your flesh. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Notice that. Remember we just talked about this? He's like, these are principles you've already learned. <laughs> what saith the scripture? No, no new information here. Just go back to how it works. What happens? Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? What happened when, when Abraham didn't want to listen to God and said, ah, I think I'm going to sleep with Hagar. What happened in that situation? God says, you idiot. Why'd you do that? She's gone. Why, why, would you, why would you do that? I promised something, and you decided that you're going to do it in your own flesh. You said, I don't think that you can do it, God. I'm getting too old. I don't know if I... God says, I told you I can do this, and I'm going to do this. And you laugh, and you think about that. You think about laughing in the face of God. Can you just imagine that for a second? But now, now bring this full circle. And we'll close with this. Imagine Abraham there, right? He's thinking, man, I got I to do something. I got to do something. I, I, I got to figure something out. I mean, I got to do something. And God's like, you fool. You don't need to do anything. I already told you I was going to make this happen. So Abraham does, oh, probably going to sleep with my handmaid. Okay, so he sleeps with Hagar. And what is that? The work of his flesh. And what is that? The motions of sin. And what is that? What does God say with that? Ooh, good job. I know you were just trying. You, were, you, were, you, were, you had good intentions here. No, what is that? 
They that are in the flesh cannot do what? Cannot please God. Did that act to please God when, when Abraham did that? No. So what did God say? She's gone. Cast her out. Why? She have any, we don't want anything to do with your flesh. Your flesh needs to be out of here. You see how this all works? See, see how there's so much continuity in the scripture? That, that puts a smile on my face. I get excited about that stuff. So what does he say? Nevertheless, what say the scripture? What, what about Abraham's flesh? What do we do? He says, cast out the bondwoman and her son. Notice this. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Right? Little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. But I just want to help out a tiny bit. That's your flesh. And that's sin. Good thing is, Christ died for those sins. Even the sin of unbelief. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence, Paul says, in you, through the Lord, that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Verse number 31 of Galatians 5, he says, So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And Paul goes on to say in verse number, uh, we just finished that verse in uh, 9 and 10 of chapter 5, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then as the offense of the cross ceased, I would they were even what? Cut off, which trouble you. Get rid of them. We don't need them in here. Those guys are, but wait, we, we, we need their funds. They give a lot of money to our church. I'm glad they do. But we don't need them here, right? How many times people stay in a church because they, Trying to just keep the funds going. Trying to keep that budget. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh. And notice this. This, is, this occasion of the flesh is, is to do what? He's talking in the sense of, don't let these guys, you know, and what they're doing, get underneath your skin. Don't let them do what? He says, really, you need to love one another. That's why he says in verse number 14, he says, they can put the law on top of you all day long, but here it is. For all the laws are filled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Why? Because love is fulfilling of the law. So I hope that's been helpful. We'll pick up here next week. <clears throat> Apologize for my voice, but uh, next week what we're going to discuss <coughs> is show you that Peter does. Peter does understand the dichotomy of the flesh. He doesn't understand it as much as Paul does in Romans 6, but in 1 Peter 4, he does do this. We're going to uh, finish up with, uh, with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 on this issue to get a complete grasp of what the legalists are really missing, what the Judaizers aren't seeing with their eyes. They've been blinded. And Satan continues to blind them, and that veil will be lifted off when they believe that, that Jesus Christ is that all-sufficient sacrifice, and he is the fulfillment of the law. All right, and then we'll go through, of course, you know, when, when he says, Peter talks about God made choice among us. And then the last thing I'm going to say is... James makes a statement. He says, How a God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out a people for his name. And you go, Where did that happen? What was that all about? And uh, that's, that's a really good, easy phrase, actually. It's pretty cool because it goes through uh, more of the, the divine plan of God. So, known unto God are his works and his ways, right? All right, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for the time to study the.